In our last episode, we talked about the legacy of New Sweden. And now, even though it was a small colony, and it wasn't around for very long, if you remove it from history, everything afterward spirals out of control and turns out a lot different. What I forgot to mention is all of the wonderful things that are in history as the result of New Sweden, as far as geography is concerned. Look around the state of Delaware in particular, and you can see the influence and legacy of New Sweden. So I'm sorry I didn't mention that before, and it just popped in my head after I published the episode. And I'm a genuine guy, and I'm not going to go back and re-edit it. It's staying as it is, but I thought I'd mention it up front here. Now in this episode, we move beyond New Sweden, the southern part of New Netherland, to the very top of New Netherland. Now today, if you live in New York State, you know there are various ways to divide up the state into different regions. You'll have the uh, New York City region, and of course you have all the different boroughs down there. You have the Long Island area, you have the North Country, you have the Capital Region, you have Western New York, you have Central New York, you have the Southern Tier, you have the the Adirondacks. There's, there's a whole bunch of things you can do, right? There's a whole bunch of divisions, a bunch of different ways you can carve up that pie. But the basic division to divide New York State into two pieces is upstate and downstate. Now, if you're from upstate New York and you travel anywhere, when somebody says, where are you from? You always say upstate New York. This way, they don't think you're from New York City because they always think you're from New York City. And now the argument that I'm going to make throughout this episode is that this division in upstate and a downstate New York really began all the way back during the time of the colony of New Netherland. As we talked about in previous episodes, if you lived in the area of New Netherland that would now be downstate New York, around New York City, your experience of history was a bit different than if you lived up in what is now the Albany area, in the New Netherland town of Beverwick, or the area around it called Rensselaerwick, owned by Killian Van Rensselaer and the Rensselaer family. Now, if you lived in the upstate portion, around Beverwick, you had a, a fairly peaceful existence. Your uh, relations with the Native Americans were admirable, especially with the Mohawk and the rest of the Haudenosaunee. Meanwhile, if you lived downstate, you were surrounded by Algonquin people, and warfare on a catastrophic level broke out every five to nine years. And in this episode, we're going to get into more of those differences. How that relates to today and right now is where is that dividing line between upstate New York and downstate New York? It's a cultural division. Various government agencies have their own personal line for administrating New York State, so it varies bureau to bureau, and person to person, based on their opinion of where are we culturally in the upstate and where are we culturally in the downstate. The upstate overall being slightly more conservative, the upstate overall having slightly less money, and less economic ties to New York City itself. Downstate is stereotyped as being more progressive, more expensive, the real estate especially far more expensive, and being culturally and economically linked directly to the affairs of New York City. So what are the various opinions on where this line is between upstate and downstate New York? Well, some people put the line as far south as directly above New York City. Everything above New York City is upstate, which would be 90 plus percent of the land in New York State. And then other people put it as far north, without too much controversy, as Orange County, New York. That's about as far north as you can go without getting into a real argument over calling something upstate. And that just so happens to be on the southern border of Ulster County. I'm going to make the argument that any settlement in New York that grew out of the influence of Fort Amsterdam in what was New Amsterdam is going to be part of downstate today. And then any settlement that came out of or depended on the economic influence of Fort Orange in modern-day Albany, New York, will be part of the upstate. Of course, this excludes much of western New York, which would have been part of the Iroquois Confederacy at the time. And to add a little piece of evidence to my argument right up front, Ulster County, like I mentioned, the firewall of what people consider to be upstate New York, was originally settled not by European settlers from New Amsterdam. They were settled by European settlers from Beverwick, 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 and Rensselaerwick in the modern-day capital region, upstate New York. And so to this day, that remains the firewall of the upstate. All right, 
And as a last note on this subject before we dive back into history, in a very, very, very future episode of this podcast, we're going to talk about a movement that exists to separate New York State into more than one state or to create different autonomous zones within the state. So this is the Other States of America History Podcast. And as I said in my introductory episode, I'm not political and I don't want this podcast to be political. But if this thing exists to the point where I'm up to the modern day, it's going to get a little bit political, but I'm not going to take sides. So if you can't wait for that episode to come out, put your head in the freezer and have somebody pull you out, I don't know, four or five years from now, and it might be up on iTunes. All right, but now we're diving back in time to New Netherland. And we're going to learn about upstate New Netherland. We're going to hear about wars, and we're going to hear about interracial relations. So things are going to get messy, both literally and figuratively here. In previous episodes, we talked about Fort Orange. And before that, little Fort Nassau on an island in the Hudson River. It's where the Dutch went to trade furs with the Native American population. This trading hub caused a war between the Mohawk and the Mohegans back in the 1620s, and the Mohawk pushed the Mohegans out, cleared a whole bunch of land for themselves. And since that time had elapsed, we saw that Killian Van Rensselaer bought a huge chunk of land, which would now be all of pretty much Rensselaer and Albany County, New York State today. And that was his private patroon ship. And inside of it contained Fort Orange. Now, in another episode, we talked about how Fort Orange grew a settlement around it. And Stuyvesant, Peter Stuyvesant, the last director of the colony, he said, okay, this is, this is murky waters here. We have this thing called Rensselaerwick. We got this fort here. One guy owns all this land, but the fort is owned by the company. And he said, no, 600 paces all around the fort. We're making a town. It's called Beverwick. It's independent from the patroon. Killian Van Rensselaer, you don't own that. So now all of a sudden we have Rensselaerwick, we have Beverwick, and inside of that we have Fort Orange, which at this time is falling into disrepair. Because that's where you went to trade furs with the Dutch West India Company if you were a Native American. However, at this time, the Dutch West India Company is no longer dealing in furs. They allow anyone to deal in furs as long as you do it at the fort in the open so they can see the transactions being made. And in the last decade of the existence of New Netherland, the upstate of it sleepy and peaceful though it is, is becoming a little bit crowded in places. And there are certain restrictions, like on the manor of Rensselaerwick, you are essentially a tenant farmer or an employee of this patroon. And that comes with all sorts of limitations a regular person living in New Netherland doesn't have to follow. And then there's the town of Beverwick, which is small and encapsulated by the patroonship. People in what is now upstate New York wanted to spread out a little. So while the core of the capital region of New York State had been settled by Europeans, it was time for them to branch out a little bit. One group is going to go to the Northwest and found a city called Schenectady, place of my birth. And then another group is going to go south down the Hudson River and found the town that will eventually be known as Kingston, New York. As it turns out, my ancestors were among those who founded Schenectady, and my wife's were among those who went south and founded Kingston. The earliest settlement of these expansions beyond Rensselaerwick and Beverwick would be the Esopus settlements. Yes, I said Esopus. If you look it up, there's some controversy on how to say the word Esopus. So the people who live in that area, the area that is now inside of Ulster County, they usually say Esopus, I believe. I've been there a couple of times, a number of times just over this last summer. And then people outside of Ulster County tend to say Esopus, which might be slightly more historically accurate. So I'm just going to interchangeably say whatever I want, because it's my podcast and you got to listen to what I say. And the first settler in the Esopus area, the Esopus area, the Esopus area, was an Englishman by the name of Thomas Chambers, who had Dutch allegiance. He lived in Rensselaerwick for a while and appears to be a man who built himself up inside of the Dutch society of the colony. Like so many who came after him, he was tired of the rules of living on another man's land, Rensselaer, and so he decided to go south, and the natives there, the Espis Indians, invited him there. Now, at this time, the 1650s, Native American groups above in latitude of what is New Spain, 
generally want to be near European groups because neither the Europeans nor the Native Americans truly understand germ theory. So they don't understand totally the causes of these plagues, although some people figure it out. They figure out that it's contact. And the only way that Native Americans can get trade goods from the entire rest of the world beyond their pre-existing contacts is through these European groups. Now, the Esopus Indians in particular uh, needed outside supplies probably more than any other Native American group outside of those being squeezed out of New England at this time. Because to their north are the Mohawk, who are getting guns from the Dutch. To their south, beyond the Lene Lenape groups, are the Sesquenehenoch, I believe I said their name right, who are getting guns from the Swedes in the early 1650s. And then if you go to the east, even the Mohegan, it is reported, are getting access to guns probably through the Dutch. So on three sides, they're surrounded by native groups who have access to weaponry that they do not. Gunpowder, firearms, things that go boom. So in 1652, the Sopus Indians give Thomas Chambers about 76 acres of land on which to start a farm. And now over the remaining part of the decade, he's going to slowly lure more settlers to this early settlement. He'll be the de facto leader. He doesn't have any official title at this point, and the entire settlement is actually going to be administered out of Fort Orange and Beverwick. The courts, the shouts, and the sheppens, so the sheriffs and the, and the deputies, are all going to be from Beverwick. So, again, firmly part of upstate, or up colony in this case. Eventually, this settlement will be known as Wiltschwick, or Wiltschwick, something like that. My pronunciation in English is barely comprehensible, uh, never mind Dutch, basically meaning wild town. So town in the woods. And it is going to be a wild town. This is a very violent time anywhere in the world, but in what's going to be future Kingston, th there's a lot of violence going on. Thomas Chambers himself is in the court records as having stabbed several people. And him and other settlers are in the court records as having shot other settlers' livestock. So if I can't physically hurt you, I'm going to just go up and shoot your pig in the head. So these people are not modern by any stretch of the imagination. One subject I rarely talk about in this podcast, and that's just because of the nature of the documents that were left behind for New Netherland and how they're, they're mostly business related and written by men. And, you know, they're either business or court records is the role of women. And I think in my next episode, I'm really going to focus on gender roles. But we see in the Kingston court records that women had a pretty prominent role and they were fairly independent. We see that women are collecting debts that other people have and they, they seem to, to be loan sharks of sorts, private, private loaners of money anyway. We also see in the court record that women are fighting with each other, calling each other names. There's court records involving men who call women witches and, and whores, and the women are allowed to testify in court, which in some places in the world right now, women are not considered to be reliable witnesses. But in Dutch culture and in New Netherland culture, they are. So that's something. Peter Stuyvesant himself, when he became aware of this growing settlement, he took favor to it and he saw it as a, a growing source for agriculture. Now, remember, there's a always a deficit for food in the New World when it comes to these European colonies. Not so much the ones based around the Atlantic coast, but often the Caribbean, where you're basically carpet bombing an entire island with seeds to grow cash crops like sugarcane. And you're not growing food. Well, now you need to import food from different places. Esopus was looked at as a potential food source for the colony itself and other Dutch possessions. So that's why Stuyvesant took favor on it. That being said, as settlers streamed in, there was no central planning. So the early settlements in, in what is Ulster County, the, the very earliest ones, they all were just random things all over the place. It's a lot like how uh, New Amsterdam was before Stuyvesant showed up. No central planning whatsoever. People just building things wherever. A lot of a lot of what Andrew Brink, the author Andrew Brink, uh, English professor, called individualism at this time. The Espis settlers, the Esopus settlers, whatever you want to say, were incredibly individualistic. They were looking out for their own. They were considering their own opportunities. And they were going to build or farm wherever they wanted to, no matter what or who had gotten the way off. <laughs> Boy, doesn't that sound a little bit like a, a little bit like a New York stereotype? Yeah, yeah, it is. And here it is. 300 and something years ago. The last name of some of these early families were Chambers, Swartout, I, I know I said that wrong, Brandt, Schoenmacher, Von Breedsteed, I know I said that one wrong too, DeWitt, Andreas, Van Gorder, 
Weigerts, Schlecht, Bose, Pels, Decker, Westerkamp, and many others that I am choosing not to mispronounce. But the Kingston settlers, or the early Esopus settlers, they were about to introduce something to the Native Americans. And no, it wasn't an infectious disease, although I'm sure that ravaged them at some point. But at this point in time, the major sin, the, 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 the forbidden fruit to be introduced to the Native Americans at Esopus would be alcohol. Now, throughout the colony, it was illegal to sell alcohol to Native Americans because Native American sachems and chiefs, they would come to the Dutch and say, this alcohol is destroying our youth. It's, it's toppling our society. It is not a good influence. Please stop selling it to us. And the Dutch, who wanted always to maintain good relations with Native Americans, often they failed, were like, yeah, we should make that illegal. That didn't stop individuals from doing it. Remember, this colony is extremely stretched out. Like I said earlier, uh, Esopus, the Esopus settlement is being administered, as far as law and order is concerned, from Fort Orange and Beverwick, which today is like an hour and 15 minute drive away. Probably a two-day journey in a boat away at this point in time. So it didn't matter what the law was. If people, if people were willing to trade for alcohol, alcohol was going to get traded. And again, another rare glimpse into the life of women in this colony. Susanna Jensen, at one point at the Esopus settlement, was caught selling booze to the Native Americans. Now, she had a, it was a pretty severe punishment. I believe she was going to be exiled and all these other things. But she successfully pled down her case. Now, I see this in the court records, that the women are more successful at drumming up sympathy among the men on the court, and they're able to almost, almost without exception, get away with a slap on a wrist, on their wrist, or nothing at all. But let's turn and think about how alcohol would affect the Esopus Indian society, or Native American society, American Indian, whatever you want to say. Now, they hadn't had any sort of drug that was a drink before this point in time. They had tobacco, and there were other little things here or there, tobacco being the major drug of Native American society in this part of the um, North American continent. But they didn't have a liquid that would produce any sort of drug effect. So you can imagine the powder keg that would go off when this is suddenly introduced. It reminds me of a quote I heard from one of those old rock stars from the 60s. I don't remember who exactly it was. But it, um, I believe it was one of the female singers, and she said, basically, back then we didn't know what these drugs could do. We didn't know the bad side of them. We didn't know what it could lead to. We only knew the fun you could have with it. And then, of course, after a couple of years of doing these things, they very tragically found out what drugs can do to a person. Very similar to what's going on to the Sopus Indians right now in the time period we're talking about, the 1650s into the 1660s. So young Native American men especially were working on farms and trading their day labor for alcohol. And then they would drink this alcohol, and for one thing, they have no natural tolerance or ability to digest alcohol better than any other group of human beings. In fact, there are many groups in Europe where alcohol has been a part of their culture for so long, we find that they have been genetically selected for alcohol tolerance or alcohol digestion. Native Americans are not one of those groups, so that's nature. And then there's nurture. You have a culture that has no built-in mechanism for dealing with alcoholism or binge drinking or the young discovering alcohol. It doesn't exist yet. They don't know how to deal with this unique problem. A third thing that might come into play, tobacco had a spiritual role in the culture. So the idea of getting yourself into a different headspace or experiencing a drug, tobacco, fell into with communing with the spirits of the world. Alcohol also being able to alter the way your brain works or the way you see the world might have had a spiritual component to it at first. So even the elders and the established people in the hierarchy of Native American society, the Esopus Indians in particular, they might have seen alcohol at first as some way to commune with spirits or just open your mind to new things. Of course, that would all come crashing down when all the negatives of alcohol start to compile as it does in our world today. So while... The Esopus Indians were experiencing alcohol for the first time. The settlers in what is now Kingston, they were making the alcohol. And of course, it was illegal to trade it. But it's thought that a, a large minority, maybe a third of the homes and farms, rather, 
had a still of some sort. They were distilling some sort of liquor to sell to the Native Americans. And of course, if you have a still in your house, you're probably going to drink a little yourself. So we have Native Americans dealing with alcoholism, a problem they've never had before. And then you have this settlement of mostly English and Dutch folks who are also just getting drunk all the time. And their version of the police are a two-day boat ride away. So you could see the, the factor, the forces are mounting for conflict. And in fact, the author Andrew Brink says that the Esopus settlers were primed for conflict. They were ready for conflict. And because both sides were drinking so much, and the youth were getting involved and fighting and bickering back and forth, not only within each cultural group, because there's a lot of court records coming out of uh, Esopus, Esopus, whatever you want to call it, there was also growing drunken animosity and fighting between the groups, between the European settlers and the Esopus natives. And you might say to you, yourself, well, Eric, where, where's the evidence of this? Well, I'm going to give it to you. Just be patient. Listen to me. Okay, around 1658, we get the first whispers of people wanting to go to war, lusting for war. Before World War I, it was common for young men especially to actually want to go to war. So this, this is something that's deep in the human psyche that we don't really think about today, but it's still there. It's rumbling. It's beneath the surface, beneath the waves. So 1658, Stuyvesant gets a report that a young boy had been killed by the Esopus Indians and that the people of Esopus were looking for revenge. Stuyvesant himself went up river to the Esopus settlement, the Esopus settlement, and he interviewed people. He, he did an investigation of what exactly is going on at this wild town. He deduced that the settlers were making up basically false flag excuses to provoke a war with the Esopus Indians. And so Stuyvesant rightly blamed the settlers because as it turns out, that boy was killed by an accident, one, and by natives from a different tribe. Had nothing to do with the Esopus Indians. And so Stuyvesant chastised them. He said, you got to get along with these people, all right? You're living in their land. Get along with them. But in true Stuyvesant style, he turns around and he talks to the Native Americans and tries to set them straight. Because Stuyvesant's a tough guy. He's got to prove he's tough. And at the end of the day, even though he doesn't particularly think the people at Kingston are good folks at this point in time, they're still his people. He's in charge of them. He talks to the Esopus Sachem and, and um, the other chiefs and whatnot. And they say to him, y your people are selling alcohol to our people and we can't handle our young men. The youths are just going crazy. They're doing all sorts of things on their own. They're not listening to us. They're, they're violent and they're, they won't listen to reason. Please stop selling us alcohol and we won't have these problems. And then they also say, if, if this keeps happening, there's, there's going to be issues. We're, we're going to be warring with one another and there's no one who can stop that. Stuyvesant responds in a way probably meant to scare these people to death. He says to them, If any of your young savages want to fight, let them come on. I will place man against man... Nay, I will place 20 against 40 of your hotheads. It is not manly to threaten farmers and women and children who are not warriors. So all in all, on this trip up river for Stuyvesant, he seems thoroughly pissed off with both the natives and the settlers. And before he leaves, he says to the settlers, you people are all spread out. This is a very dangerous situation. Places like this, like Staten Island, was just wiped off the face of the earth two, three years ago in the Peachtree War. All right? This settlement needs to condense itself. You have your separate farms, but you all need to build houses within a stockade. Make a couple blocks for yourself, and you're all going to live together, protect each other. That's what you're going to do. And to their credit, the early Esopus settlers, Esopus settlers, they organized themselves into a stockade. They lived in a walled town, with the exception of Thomas Chambers who refuses to move. He's just going to keep living his own life. And as far as we know, he had pretty good relations with the Esopus Indians. He had been there now a number of years. So he alone remains outside of the walls. He's going to do his own thing. Remember, he likes to stab people. He shoots a pig every now and then. N not a not a kind of guy you'd want in your town anyway. So he can go live off, off in the woods, whatever. But it's going to be this guy, Thomas Chambers, the first settler in the area. He's going to start the first Espus War. 
And there's an ongoing debate on whether he meant to do it or not, if it was an accident or misunderstanding. But in August 1659, just in time to start harvesting crops, Thomas Chambers hires eight Esopus natives to husk corn for the day. And he pays them with brandy. Big no-no, not supposed to do that. The natives don't want you doing that with their young men, and the Dutch don't want you doing that either. He does it anyway. So after they get paid their brandy, they go away for the night. But they're still pretty close by. The people of the Esopus settlement, they can hear these natives, these young men. And of course, they probably have a fire lit. They start drinking. They start having a party. You know, they're, they're making all the sorts of noises young men make when they drink alcohol. And of course, this would cause some alarm for the settlement, already uneasy about the natives in the area. So the militia within the stockade, they start hearing these things. They start hearing the natives and their party. And they decide to go out with their weapons in a scouting party. And they find where this party is going on, and they open fire. Without provocation, they attack the Native Americans. And at least one of that party was killed. Very quickly, in an act of revenge, 600 Esopus natives descend upon the early Esopus settlement. They commence to siege the stockade and the town within. They burned down buildings by throwing in torches. They captured people and they burned them at the stake, as many as 10 people. Messengers would try to escape in the night and make their way down river to tell Stuyvesant what was occurring. For three weeks, the stockade was under siege and all the messengers were captured and killed. Thomas Chambers himself, the cause of this war, living outside of the stockade, was captured. And he somehow he got away. He claims that in the night, he killed all six braves that were holding him captive. More likely, he provided some sort of ransom. When news finally did reach Stuyvesant and the downriver portion of New Netherland, people abandoned their farms. They thought this was the beginning of another Native American uprising, like during Keefe's War or the Peachtree War. They thought it was all starting up over again. Now, this is what would now be downstate New York, New Jersey. The people in what is now upstate New York, Fort Orange, Beverwick, Rensselaerwick, they barely batted an eye. They barely knew what was happening. And in fact, their natives in the north decided to remain neutral. The Haudenosaunee said, we're not getting involved in this. Stuyvesant organized a force and made his way upriver to the Esopus settlement, only to discover that the siege has been lifted. The settlement had withstood three weeks of murder, torture, fires being set, contact being cut off. But after three weeks, the Esopus natives abandoned their attempt. But no truce would be met at this time, no peace. And so the war would dim at this point in time, but would drag on into 1660 and erupt in moments of violence occasionally. This time, on behalf of the Kingston settlers, uh, on the 20th of May, 1660, and this is out of John Abbott's history of the colony, in this quote he mixes his own words with that of the source, Ensign Smith, or Schmidt, depending on the source. The 20th of May, 1660, Ensign Smith took a party of 75 men and advanced upon them. The barking of dogs announced their approach. Just as the band had arrived, within sight of the wigwams, they all made good for their retreat, with the exception of one of the oldest and best of their chiefs. His name was Pramother. We know not whether it was pride of character or his infirmary that prevented his escape. It is said, however, that he received the soldiers very hauntingly, aiming his gun at them, saying, what are you doing here, you dogs? The weapon was very easily wrenched from his feeble hands. A consultation was held as to what should be done with this courageous but powerless old chief. As it was a considerable distance to carry him, we struck him down with his own axe. The Kingston settlers are striking back against those who killed their family members and tortured and burned at the stake. And then the natives, of course, were striking back because... Somebody shot some of their youth. This is a full-scale blood feud. And while the author, Andrew Brink, calls this genocide on the part of the Isopa settlers, 
it doesn't seem like that's what they had in mind in the modern sense of a genocide and the attempt to completely remove an ethnic group from the living world. Rather, this is a senseless, rageful blood feud in which both sides are looking to punish the other for their dead. Now, the Aesopus native tribe was never very large, and even the small Kingston settlement, with support from New Amsterdam, slowly turned the tides of this war in their favor. So the, the settler raids became greater and greater, and the natives retreated and retreated, had heavier losses, were unable to recover as fast as the Dutch could. 1659, there is a failed peace conference of some sort, and an Aesopus Sachem says, We do not harbor any evil intentions against you. We patiently submit to the blows each of you inflicts upon us. We suffer your people to take away from us our fields of corn. So many times your nation has struck us and injured us at different places. We wish to live in peace. We pass many things by in silence, for we are not inclined to trouble. At some point, the Dutch capture a number of young Aesopus braves, and they bring them further down river to New Amsterdam, and Stuyvesant decides, we need more manpower on the island of Carousel. And so he deports them there to the ABC Islands, the Caribbean, and he enslaves them. I haven't found any record of what their final fate was, but you take people with a skin tone for upstate New York and you put them in the Caribbean, it's pretty much assured you're going to work them to death. By July of 1660, Stuyvesant and the Dutch are so feared by the Aesopus, they're afraid to even meet. They're afraid of having the same fate, of, of either being murdered or being shipped away to a far unknown land never to be seen again. When peace negotiations finally did commence, it was only under the watchful eye of sachems from other tribes. I believe the Mohawk were there, and I believe the Muncie Indians belonging to the Lene Lenape were there, and maybe even some Susquehannock. I don't have that written down here, but I remember reading that at some point. And so tribes from the north and south were there to overlook the proceedings of this peace negotiation. And those tribes were firmly on the side of the Dutch. Although all of the visiting sachems chastised both the Dutch settlers and the Aesopus Indians for their actions, ultimately these sachems would lecture the Aesopus Indians on their behavior far more and put far more consequence on them as a result of this war. It was recommended to them by these Native Americans and by the Dutch that the Aesopus Indians move further inland, move west, go over the Catskills, find somewhere else to live, get out of the area. The Muncie Sachem even says, this land isn't yours. The Dutch have their portion, and your portion belongs to us. So this source is a little bit confusing. Maybe at some point, the Muncie had control of this land, and the Aesopus as refugees were allowed to live there for a time, or maybe some point later, the Aesopus were subjugated by a portion of the Lene Lenape. Either way, the Muncie Sachem says, you don't own this land. Even the land you have your settlement on is not owned by you. And so ultimately, they were told to head west. The Aesopus Indians did not head west. But they literally buried a hatchet and made a tense and awkward peace with the Dutch settlers. Stuyvesant, very smart man, very shrewd man, before heading back to New Amsterdam, made sure that there was a, a new system of crime and punishment in what would be Kingston. He set up their first inferior courts, and he set up a shout and a shepin, which again are badly pronounced Dutch words for basically sheriff and deputies. And he started the criminal justice system proper of these Ulster County settlements separate from those being administered out of Beverwick. So the end of the first Espus War is a independence of the settlements from the influence of what is now the capital region. And Wiltschwick, later Kingston, the Esopus settlement continued to grow. By 1663, they perhaps had 60 to 70 families living there. Now, after this first war, the people of this settlement understanding why you need to live inside of a palisade when you live out on the frontier. But a new settlement popped up because Kingston had flourished so much in this short period of time, 
a new town was formed, and it was literally called Newtown. New Dorp was the name, in and around the uh, current town of Hurley, New York. Now, the Esopus Indians, they did not believe that this new area of settlement was legally purchased from them. They, there was a questioning involved as to where the Kingston settlement begins and ends, and New Dorp was not part of the deal as far as they were concerned. So when the settlers at this new town decided to start building palisades of their own, the Native Americans would come and tear them down. And they would repeat what they believed. They would say, you're not going to build a wall here. You're not supposed to be here. You should go back to where you belong. Because this land right here, this is our farmland. Stuyvesant received word that there were these conflicts back and forth, these exchanges of words. But even he couldn't tell what was going to happen next. June 7th, 1663. The Sopus Indians completely level New Dorp, New Town. The men, the women, the children, anyone they could kill, they killed. The livestock, the crops, they burned the corpses, they burned the buildings. 26 children were taken captive. Nine women were taken captive. While this is occurring, at Wilchwick, future Kingston, the Native Americans of the Sopus tribe had also peacefully come into the town to trade and had spread themselves out among the town. A couple people here, a couple people there, made their way peacefully into people's houses, understanding that they were going to engage in some sort of trade. When word came by horsemen that New Dorp had been leveled by this tribe, and then when that happened, the war whoop went up, and all the natives in the town started massacring the people at Kingston. Before the natives could be repelled, the town had been set on fire. The palisade had been set on fire. Nine men were dead who were not soldiers. Three soldiers were killed. Two women were killed. And two pregnant women were killed. All in all, this had been a planned attack of two settlements in one day that completely devastated the European population of the area. The captives, of course, were tortured. Some were killed. One was a young boy named Yakum just nine years old, and for three months, natives tortured him by putting burning coals on him, dumping pipe ash on him as a source of entertainment. He was one of the ones that was actually returned at one point, scarred both inside and out. Among the captives, Winti Rosa manages to escape captivity, her children being left behind. She gets back to town. She rallies the men for the cause. The blood feud has come back. The Esopus Wars have begun again. The Mohawk, allies of the Dutch, they go about rescuing from the Esopus Indians as many captives as they can. They rescue Rachel Van Imbrock. Rachel, being a very smart and courageous woman, memorized the layout of the native castle, as they would have called it at the time, and where exactly it was and how to get there. And she herself leads the raiding party to go and get back these other captives, these family members who are being tortured by the natives. By spring of the next year, all but three captives would be recovered. But during that time, the Dutch went about systematically destroying settlement after settlement of the Sopus natives. Every time they found a fortress, they took it out, they scattered the natives, and then they followed them further up into the hills of the Catskills, found their hideouts, found their strongholds, burned their fields, hundreds of acres of corn, gone. This is the moment that might verge on genocide. This might be where the blood feud turns into something more organized. Now, if you were a Kingston settler 350 or so years ago, just put yourself in their shoes. We've had two wars. We've had surprise attacks. You've had women and children and men tortured and killed, set on fire, sometimes alive. Your sense of safety is gone. You have relatives who are either have been killed in malicious ways or have returned to you scarred and damaged from the experience of captivity. You start to go a little crazy. And it is at this point that the Esopus Indians begin to leave history altogether. By 1664, peace negotiations commence in New Amsterdam. The Esopus natives have to travel there 
it's a, um, a silent admission of their complete loss. They travel to New Amsterdam, their population being decimated, literally decimated, down to one-tenth of what it was before these wars, had perhaps 20 or 30, as many as 40 warriors left in their tribe, and they negotiated a peace settlement. Part of that peace settlement would be the complete abandonment of their land to the Dutch and to the allied native tribes, and the order for them to move west. However, the Sopus lost their individual identity, and the few survivors assimilated into other Lene Lenape tribes. And there is no more Esopus tribe. You can't find them. There's no reservation. There's no organization. They cease to exist. However, they may have descendants among the Lene Lenape people today. Much like how the Haudenosaunee absorbed many mostly Iroquois groups into their own, and thus represent those groups today, like the Huron and the Erie and the Cat people. The Lene Lenape would absorb a lot of these Algonquin refugees or captives, depending on if they were the victims of war or the target of war. Now, the European settlers at what would become Kingston, they look like the bad guy in a lot of this story. However, again, if you put yourself in their shoes, you can see the fear and the paranoia and the, the, the need for revenge that would develop in seeing family members killed and tortured. Now, the, again, the author, Andrew Brink, he actually says the entire settlement after the second Esopus War experienced PTSD. Now, he uses the court records and other scant records to come to that conclusion. I don't think you can put a town of 300, 350 years ago on the couch, so to speak, and diagnose them all with PTSD. But there is definitely trauma on both sides of this. Now, that being said, the Esopus Indians, being part of this larger Lene Lenape ethno-linguistic group and future confederation, they seem to be very alone in these wars, as if the other Lene Lenape people aren't supporting them. And, and the records seem to indicate that Unlike these wars we've seen in the past where you see a general uprising of these Algonquin people, the Esopus were set apart, and they were often lectured to by the other Lenape, and they were among the furthest north of this ethno-linguistic group. So perhaps they themselves had sins of their own? I'm not sure what I'm trying to say here, but it appears even from the native side, based on what the Haudenosaunee to the north and their own relatives to the south say and deal and how they deal with the Esopus Indians. It seems like the Esopus had um, plenty of the blame to put on their own shoulders in this. But the Dutch as the victors are going to, of course, take the blame in the modern world. So you often hear that saying, uh, to, the, to the victor goes the spoils or the, the victor writes history, the winners write history. I don't know if that's exactly true anymore. We tend to have the impulse now to see the winner in the past as some sort of oppressor or some sort of uh, negative force. So, who knows? I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> different times, different folks. Now, if we were to judge people in the past by our standards of today, expect to be judged by people in the future by their standards. Do you think you're going to hold up well? Probably not. But these two violent struggles... And the blood feuding back, the, back and forth. And the possible genocide. I'm not going to call it that. Andrew Brink did, though, however. Is going to be the firewall of what will eventually become upstate New York. It's going to be the line in the sand that says this is the upstate. And everything south of us is the downstate. So now let's move to the other side of this expansion. When Beverwick and Rensselaerwick moved to the northwest. And the founding of the town of Schenectady. You can't tell the story of how Schenectady was founded without bringing up this character who we've mentioned before, Arndt Van Curler, sometimes called Arndt Van Corlear, if you want to take more of a French interpretation of his name. But around Schenectady, you hear, you hear Van Curler far more often. Van Curler was a grandnephew of Killian Van Rensselaer. So yet again, Killian Van Rensselaer sends over a, a, a yet another nephew. He has so many nephews, and so many of them are completely incompetent. But this one's interesting, because 
Arn Van Curler comes over 1638, right around there. And he was probably the relative of Killian Van Rensselaer that Peter Minuet mentioned. On his secret mission to found New Sweden, he had to take on board some passengers for Van Rensselaer. So as not to raise suspicion that he was about to, you know, cut the bottom third off of this colony. It's my contention, and maybe somebody else has also come up with this conclusion, that the passenger Minuet took on was Arndt Van Curler. Van Curler was hired by his great uncle to overlook the manor of Rensselaerwick, or the patroonship of Rensselaerwick. He was to be the eyes and ears in the colony for Killian Van Rensselaer back home. He was to run the place. But he was more interested in building himself a nice house, he was a bit of a drinker, but he appears to be a jolly drinker. Someone you would want to party with, and not an angry drunk like Thomas Chambers, who uh, gets drunk and wants to stab people and shoot pigs. None of that going on with uh, Arndt Van Curler. He's a party guy. And boy, did this guy party. Because he's, he's often been criticized for spending too much time out in the woods. That's how people at the time described him. Now, now, what that's a euphemism for is he's probably selling liquor to the Native Americans. He's probably the major source of gun running to the Native Americans, which will drastically change the history of the entire interior of the continent of North America. This has been greatly understudied. But the supply of weapons to the Haudenosaunee probably came through Arendt. There are other Dutch arms dealers who are secretly dealing in the area. In the area, but Van Curler had all the right connections. It was probably him. Let's face it. That's what I'm going to contend. So he's selling them booze. He's selling them guns, and of course, making a profit for himself. And then he's having lots of romantic trysts with native women. During this time and afterwards, he's known to have at least one child with a Mohawk woman. At least one. Maybe more than one, and maybe more than one by more than one woman. Eventually, though, his extracurricular activities uh, cause some neglect for Rensselaerwick, and Killian Van Rensselaer, he passes away, and his kids take control. Now we're talking about your boss not being your great uncle, but your boss being roughly your first cousin once removed or second cousin even. Uh, basically, the, the relationship, the familial relationship between boss and employer is moving further and further away. Not only that, but Killian Van Rensselaer, some of his kids decide to come over at certain points. So now your boss is right there in your backyard. Van Curler's nice with them. He's familial, like we said. He gets along. He's jovial. Everyone loves him, although they might criticize his work ethic a little bit. But after a while, he's feeling the squeeze from his family, and he's looking to spread out. Go somewhere, I don't know, maybe a little closer to those Mohawk women he's so fond of. And maybe he likes drinking with the natives. Maybe he likes selling them guns and getting furs from them, which he isn't supposed to be doing. And from Beverwick and Rensselaerwick, there's one great location in order to get all this stuff done. A couple of years before he decided to spread out, he went to the nearest Mohawk castle to look for a rumored uh, captured Catholic priest, a man named Isaac Yogues, or Isaac Jogues, who we talked about before. His first attempt to get Isaac Jogues back to France safely involved him going to a castle and trying to ransom him, which didn't work out. But on his way there, leaving the manor of Rensselaerwick, he went through this beautiful land. He called it in his letters the most beautiful land he's ever seen. Nice, flat land slow rolling river and the dutch are going to call this little track of land the groot flat i believe i'm saying that right i don't know it means the great flats and the native americans are eventually going to call this land by a couple names and then the dutch are going to interpret one of those names as schenectady now that term schenectady might have originally applied actually to albany it means land beyond the pines or just beyond the pines and it probably originally referred to the area around fort orange where the Native Americans had to come from their villages off along the Mohawk through the pine bush to get to Fort Orange and to other places. Although it could just refer to the land in Schenectady, because if you look on a map, there is the Albany pine bush, and if you're coming from one direction south and you go through the pine bush, eventually you're going to end up in the land called Schenectady. So there's a lively debate over the exact meaning of the word Schenectady, 
there's a lively debate over wh- what originally was called Schenectady. But nevertheless, this great flat land along the Mohawk River that Arden Van Curler walked through when he wanted to ransom Isaac Yogues, that would eventually become Schenectady. But let's not forget, all this illegal trading going on probably happened in those woods of Schenectady. That was the meeting ground for illegal activity. Things that you couldn't do in plain sight of Fort Orange or Beverwick or Rensselaerwick. You'd have to go off into the woods a little closer to the a little closer to the Mohawk tribe and all their settlements along the Mohawk River, and that takes you right to the area of Schenectady, or at least the general area of the eastern end of the Mohawk River. Today, what would be Schenectady, maybe as far out as Amsterdam, then maybe as far out on the other end as Cohoes Falls. Now, Van Curler's mission failed that time. He would later have to sneak away with Isaac Jogues. But on his mission there, he scouted a nice track of land. He thought he could make a nice farm for himself. And it's known that Van Curler in the future is going to do as much as he can to ransom away uh, French prisoners of war, especially if they were Catholic priests. So he, he seems to be a good guy. Again, he's a drunk, not a hard worker, likes the ladies. But if somebody is a captive of the Haudenosaunee, he knows the things that could happen to them. And even though the Dutch are allies with the Haudenosaunee, he would do his best to make sure they were back in safe hands. Now, back among the shifting jobs he has in Rensselaerwick, he has to deal on and off with Van Twiller, who is also another nephew of uh, Killian Van Rensselaer. And then he has to deal on and off with different sons of Killian Van Rensselaer. And so the family is just kind of crowding around him. He's really feeling the pressure. And it's not the lifestyle he really wants. And he wants to be a little closer to the natives. A lot closer to the natives, if you know what I mean. And he wants to to increase his holdings in the illegal fur trade. That's the leading theory as to why he decides to move to the Northwest. He wants to be... He wants to do more smuggling. He's a smuggler. Much of the story of um, the United States and America and the colonies before it involves smuggling. So, he wants to be a smuggler. I'm fine with it. So, we're just going to let that be for now. Van Curler was also married for a time. I don't know the exact timeline as to when he had relationships with Native women and when he was married to European women, and we don't really need to get into it, but um, I suspect there weren't clear boundaries between these relationships, just based on how frequent the mentions are. So, there's another thing about him that is best left to history. At one point... Around 1643, he marries the widow of Jonas Bronk, who would become the namesake for the Bronx. His farm would be the basis and the center from which the Bronx would grow out of. And before founding Schenectady, it looks like he decided to move to Beverwick. So he moved out of his family's estate, Rensselaerwick, and he got a little more freedom living in the little town of Beverwick. Of course, Fort Orange being the center of Beverwick. And Fort Orange at this time kind of falling into disrepair. It's not as important as it used to be. And at Beverwick, he became the contact man with the Mohawk. And through the Mohawk, the Haudenosaunee. So although he wasn't an official of the company, he wasn't under Stuyvesant's employment, he was unofficially the contact person between the the Dutch colony of New Netherland and the great Haudenosaunee Five Nations. So much so that for generations afterwards, we're talking way up until the time of the revolution almost, the Haudenosaunee are going to refer to the governors of New York State as Corlears because they found this guy, Arndt Van Curler, to be in such great esteem among their own people that for all intents and purposes, he was the governor of New Netherland because Stuyvesant wasn't hanging out with the Mohawks. He was down in New Amsterdam. He, he would go up to Esopus to, uh, you know, crack some heads. He was a busy man. And the, uh, the one time he did visit the Fort Orange area, he shot off a cannon. He got everyone mad at him. He made the town of Beverwick, and then he went away. So Van Curler, as far as the upstate of the colony is concerned, is like the de facto governor, the, the de facto director. He knows everybody. He knows the natives. He knows how to get things illegally. So maybe not governor. He's more like like uh he's kind of like a mafia kingpin. Let's yeah, let's call him a mafioso. And there seems to be a lot of pressure on Arendt 
to just go off and do his own thing. The 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 manner of Rensselaer Earwick, the patroonship, eventually they ban interracial relationships, specifically between natives and Europeans. That had to be levied directly at Arn Van Curler. But as we're going to learn about in a little bit, he wasn't the only one involved in intercultural exchanges. It's recorded that he has a Mohawk daughter sometime around 1652. So by this point, I'm either going to say that first marriage didn't work out, <laughs> or he became a widower. And, and by the mid-1650s, Arndt is getting itchy feet. He's not a young man anymore. He came to the colony when he was 17 or 18 years old. He might have met Peter Minuet on the way there. Had lots of adventures. But at this point, he's, he's reaching what would have been middle age for the time. And he's looking for a, a change. He's having his midlife crisis. Arndt Van Curler, again, he's part of a rich family. He has some means of his own. And now he remembers that there's this great chunk of land. This great chunk of land where I can go to see the Mohawks, where I do my illegal trading. It's where the Mohawks come in order to trade in Beverwick. Nice track of land. If I make a settlement there, I can cut off all these people. And then the people that I bring to my settlement... And myself, we're going to get the benefits of the native trade. And so he remembered, oh, that nice track of land, the Great Flats. I'm going to start a settlement there. And of course, the Mohawk give him permission. Because they love him in more than one way. They definitely love Arndt Van Curler. And now this new settlement in Schenectady would also give him the freedom he wanted. Right? So he would be closer to the Mohawks. He'd be outside of the control of his family perfect location for the man. Now, when you hear about the founding of Schenectady, it's often said, oh, the Mohawks rolled in in the 1620s, kicked out the Mohegan, and the land was basically empty. The Mohawk had yet to expand into the area, and so Arndt Van Curler could easily buy it from them because they weren't using it. This is a lie. Or in the very least, an oversimplification. The reality is, inside of what is now Schenectady County, there were Mohawk natives. They were expanding their settlements. Although ravaged by diseases, they had plenty of captives, and the population was at least starting to stabilize at this point. People were spreading out. The natives were moving further east down the Mohawk to be closer to the Dutch, just like the Dutch, led by Arndt Van Curler, want to move closer to them. So the myth that Schenectady County was just kind of emptied out by the Mohawk is a myth, because the Mohawk were already starting to live there. So it is recorded that the Mohawks had a small settlement on the south bank of the Mohawk, just west of Schenectady, as well as a small settlement just north of Schenectady in the area that would now be Scotia and Glenville, which is part of Schenectady County, if you do not know. So Arndt Van Curler, he didn't settle a bunch of land emptied out by the Mohawk. He cuddled himself up nice and cozy between two small Mohawk settlements. The easternmost settlement of the Mohawks, who they themselves were looking to cuddle up next to the Dutch. So Schenectady was the crossroads for these two ethnic groups to intermingle in every sense of the word, and for the continuing political alliance between the political entity of New Netherland and the Haudenosaunee. And as I said, even before Schenectady was founded, this seems to be the area, the general area of what is now New York State, where we had these relations. So a very famous Mohawk chief was named the Flemish Bastard. And he was probably born in the modern town of Canajo Harry, and he might have been conceived off in the woods of Schenectady. Now the Flemish Bastard had a Mohawk mother and a Dutch father. He could have actually have been Flemish, which at the time many people would have called Dutch. They're very closely linked ethnic groups. But either way, um, the Flemish Bastard was born sometime in the 1640s. So already we're seeing this population of mixed children very early on, even before the founding of Schenectady. Another family that would become important to the early Schenectady settlement was the Van Slick family. And Cor Cornelius? Cornelius, well, if he were English, we'd call him Cornelius. Cornelius Van Slick was already living near Cohoes Falls in the 1640s, and he married a Mohawk princess, in quotes, as people will call her. Her name was Otztok. Ots Otztok. I've read about this person for years, and I've never been able to pronounce this name without stuttering. Otztok. 
also known as the Queen of Hog Island. Now we have a whole bunch of stuff to talk about here. So first of all, he took a Mohawk woman as his European-style wife. You understand what that means. But what about this other guy, the Flemish bastard, who's running around um, with the uh, Mohawks? Why is he accepted among the Mohawk, Mohawks? And where is his father? And why is this not an issue? Well, the French will, will call him a bastard because we don't know who his father is. But remember, in Haudenosaunee culture, it's all based around your mother, right? Your relationship to your tribe is based on what clan you're in, and what clan you're in is based on who your mother is. So the fact that a Mohawk woman would have a child would not stigmatize the child as a bastard, because the family he belongs to would be his mother's. He would still belong to a clan. And through his own personality and perseverance and accomplishments, he could become a chief and maybe even a sachem. The same is true with Van Curler's kids. Now, if you remember in Mohawk and Haudenosaunee culture, your father didn't have the father figure role we would think of today. Rather, your maternal uncle would be more of a fatherly figure to you. These are clan systems linked by who your mother is. It's matrilineal. So through your matril matrilineal line, you can always prove that you're part of that family. I've brought this up in a previous podcast, but think about it. Before DNA tests, paternity tests, you can prove you came out of your mother. Your mother was there. People may have witnessed it. They knew she was pregnant. You came out. There you are. Now through that link, you know, your, your maternal uncle, you can prove you're related to. Because both of, you know, your mom and your uncle both came out of your grandmother. So there's the physical act of coming out of a clan member. And that's what linked you to a clan. So they didn't have the same stigma. They were full members of the Haudenosaunee culture and society. Which already had a rich culture of taking in captives and making them full members of their clans and tribes. And so these, what we would now call interracial children were not stigmatized in Mohawk culture. But let's move back over to the Dutch end of this. So the Van Slicks were interracial by today's standards. And it doesn't appear they were stigmatized either. As early settlers in and around Schenectady, they lived the Dutch lifestyle. And although being, you know, half native for the first generation, and then less so thereon, there was no stigma attached to them. It, 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 there's no indication they were treated any differently. And in fact, they often uh, were used as mediators between the two groups and received special favors. There are islands in the Mohawk that were given away by the Mohawk to members of the Van Slick family. Not as places that they would have purchased, but as chunks of land that were given to what they would have considered members of their clans. And I'm going to peel this back one more layer. I know I'm jumping all around here. Oats talk, the Mohawk princess in quotes. It's l possible that she herself was fathered by a French trader. So now we're going back even more decades. We're going way back to the point in time where the French traders were even in the area. So this area, the eastern end of the Mohawk, centered around Schenectady, Cohoes, over to Canajoharie, that area has, for a very long time, been the source of interracial communications, let's call it. And the last note on the Van Slick family, there are no Mohawk princesses, right? In order to be a princess, there usually has to be a king and a queen, right? Princesses and princes have the possibility of becoming kings and queens, unless you live in a, what's called a principality. Now, the Mohawks didn't have a principality. The Haudenosaunee didn't have a principality. They didn't have kings and they didn't have queens. So whatever position Oats Talk had, it wasn't a princess in Mohawk society because that doesn't exist. But the Europeans might have seen it as such, meaning that her clan had a particular amount of power in the area at the time, or maybe she had a maternal uncle who was a sachem. And now the Dutch would have seen through their foggy eyes of of European tradition. Oh, she's a princess. But in reality, she just had some relatives who were influential in the Haudenosaunee government or overarching confederacy.
That's all that means. But no, the Mohawks didn't have any princesses. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know there's a whole bunch of you listening at home who are saying, in my family tree, it says I'm related to a Mohawk princess and an Oneida princess and a Seneca princess. Sorry, there are no princesses. I'm sorry. But you can view these women as strong women from regular families living their native lives who decided to live out on this frontier between these two cultural worlds, the the invading European world and the existing native world. And through their marriages, carved out a whole new world and way of life. Isn't that so much more interesting and dynamic than Indian princess? Anyway, moving on. So far from being an empty area, Schenectady already had two Mohawk settlements. You already had a, a bunch of Europeans running around uh, who had native wives. And there was also this guy there named Alexander Glenn, who's actually a Scottish man. Now, he, he was a refugee from Scotland, a political refugee. Some family tradition seems to think he was of noble origin, and so his family was forced out. Eventually, he moved to the Netherlands, where all refugees went for a long while. And he started to work for the West India Company, and that's what brings him to the New World. Alexander Glenn, he traveled and owned lands as far away as Fort Casimir on the Delaware River. And he might have owned land down there when the Swedes took it over. And then, of course, he would have been kicked off his land. And eventually, he buys a huge plot of land in what is now Glenville, New York, and parts of Scotia, New York. So this is just north of Schenectady, but it's still within what's called Schenectady County. Scotia would be named after his homeland of Scotland. Scotia is another way to say Scotland. I believe probably Latin in origin. And then Glenville will be, of course, named after his last name, Alexander Glenn. He got along well with the Dutch. He worked with the company... There doesn't seem to be any issues there. He was Presbyterian, which is a Calvinist Reformed religion. So although the language was different, he was able to go to Dutch Reformed Church. Their beliefs were unified in a sense, and they they tolerated the fact that he wasn't originally part of the Dutch Reformed Church. Very tolerant when it comes to um, issues of language. Not so much different types of religions, but if the Dutch knew that your religion was like their religion... It didn't matter what language you worshipped in. They recognized that you had a kinship of beliefs. So around 1661, Arndt Van Curler gets permission to settle Schenectady. And he gets a bunch of settlers to sign up to start basically what would be uh, long strips of farms along the Mohawk. Each, each person getting a, a strip of land guaranteeing a little, a little river frontage so that they can draw water for their crops. Much in the style of the early French settlements to the north. So these early families had really familiar last names. If you're from anywhere around Schenectady, you've heard these names before. So, of course, we have Van Curler, Glenn, Brower, Veter, Vetter, Van Wagelum, Swart, Bonker, Teller, Boersbaum, Wemp, which also broke off into the Wemp and the Wemple, Wemple family, Van Slick, and Van Esselstein. A lot of Vans in that one. So if you find, if you go into your grandma's garage and you find an old phone book and you're from the Albany, Schenectady, Troy area, pull out that old phone book and look up any of these last names, you'll see a whole bunch of them. The founding families of Schenectady are still in Schenectady, by and large. But the company, the West India Company, put some rules on the Schenectady settlement. They basically said, all right, you can settle there, but you can't do any of the shit you wanted to do. So you wanted to trade in furs? You can't do that. You wanted to trade them guns and liquor? You can't do that either. And he said, don't fraternize with the Native Americans. Leave them be. Don't get involved with them. Remember, this is after the Sopus Wars. And so any sort of contact with Native Americans to the downstate of New Netherland was usually, usually led to trouble later on. Unbeknownst to them, in the upstate, of course, the Native relations among the Mohawk and the rest of the Haudenosaunee with the Dutch were fantastic. I mean, they were having kids with each other, so something was going, you know, something was working. And of course, they said, you can't participate in the fur trade. So all the things that Van Curler and these other so-called farmers, in quotes, wanted to get involved in. And the, at the end of the day, they still had to do in secret, which means that Schenectady remained a small, sleepy little Dutch community. If any of these things were going on, they had to go on behind closed doors, so to speak, or way out in the woods. So Schenectady, which should have been a boomtown, was crushed by the over-regulations and, and the, the strict rules of the colony. But for the remainder of the life of New Netherland, because this story does end, Believe it or not, after 15 hours or so. Schenectady would be the meeting point between the Haudenosaunee 
and the Dutch, these two great allies with one another. And they would have unparalleled, unbroken, positive relations, both politically and physically. And it's sad to hear, but yes, New Netherland would eventually be overtaken by the English. Now, that would be an uneasy moment for the Haudenosaunee and the English. Would they be enemies? Would they be friends? Who was there to create that peace, that lasting peace that would last for another century? Who would be there for that? Who orchestrated that great peace? Arn Van Curler. All right, let's put a bow on this podcast. Let's wrap it up right now. So in the beginning, I argued that upstate New York has been the upstate for a very long time, possibly before it was even known as New York. I argued that the places that were settled from the expansions out of Fort Orange, originally going way back, are what we call upstate. Meanwhile, the places that expanded out of the new uh, the fort of New Amsterdam on Manhattan Island would become the downstate. Now, this, of course, is excluding the waves of English people who came in. But even with them, the line still holds. So Fort Orange grew. Rensselaerwick was purchased around it. The town of Beverwick built around Fort Orange. And from there, people expanded to the northwest, founded Schenectady. To the south, founded Kingston. And to this day, like I said, the dividing line between upstate and downstate is generally agreed upon that by the time you get to Ulster County, you're firmly in upstate. It's the firewall of upstate, like I said. And so that line is held now for hundreds of years, and it might have been put in place by the Dutch in this very story that I just told. And then, of course, the downstate being centered around New Amsterdam, Fort Amsterdam, and which will become future New York City. Now we have two different stories, though, as, as upstate was splitting off. The ones who went south found a different group of Native Americans, the Esopus, who weren't keen on interrelations. They had very different rules as far as who you could have children with, who you could, have, who you could marry with. And so they weren't one for mixing with the Dutch population in the area. And the Dutch themselves were a little more prone to fighting, as the court records show. A little more independent. They didn't want to live in a stockade, which I forgot to mention. The settlers in Schenectady immediately lived in a stockade. Farms outside the stockade, and they all just huddled up inside behind Palisade Walls. So the ones who went south, a little more independent, a little more prone to war, but so were the natives down there. They were independent, prone to war, and they wanted to be left alone. And instead, we have two wars. But then those very same upstate settlers who went to the northwest, well, not the very same, but, you know, the same types of folks, they found a very different type of native up there. And they had lots of interrelations. And so we're, this is the basis for upstate New York. I don't know how else to end this. I mean, we're talking about Lots of sex, lots of war, possible genocide. I've already said it all. I'm babbling at this point. So, if you didn't like this podcast, don't give me a bad review on Apple Podcasts. Just stop listening to the podcast or email me a constructive email and tell me what's going on. But if you do like this podcast, you can go ahead and give me a five-star review, and I would very much appreciate it. So, I have no better way of wrapping this up. I'm very uncomfortable with this ending. But I have to go to the bathroom. So this has been the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis. Thank you for listening.